In this video, we're going to talk about choices to make when you are architecting a web application. I'm going to start with one of my favorite Java interview questions. Think a lot about this because when you go on an interview, you're likely going to have something like this. The first question is, what do you like about Java? Now, with any interview question, be prepared for a follow-up as well, which might test your answer on the first question. So a lot of times I'll say, what do you like about Java? And then my next question will be, have you used this or how have you used this? A lot of times people say, well, it's multi-platform. And then I ask, have you actually deployed it on multiple platforms? And a lot of times people will say no. On the same note, what do you not like about Java? And then the follow-up question is, how do you work around this? A lot of times somebody will say something that they don't like about Java. Uh, and then I'll say, well, how do you work around this? And uh, the person might not have an answer. So what's my answer to these two questions? Well, my answer is going to compare Java versus Microsoft, the world of Microsoft and C-sharp. Both definitely have their advantages. So the Microsoft advantage is that it makes the choices for you. And the good part about this is that it's very easy to get something up and running very quickly, in my opinion. Uh, if you need to get a web service up and running, it's easy to do because if you have a uh, Windows server running SQL Server and C Sharp uh, and Visual Studio, everything's integrated, ready to go. The downside is that the choices have been made for you. Uh, so if there's something you, something you prefer, uh, it might be a little more difficult to get that integrated. You actually, you know, you, you, you might not get the, the choice of what you want to work with, but what they've offered might just be good enough. With Java, you can make your own choices. So the good thing is you can pick best of breed. You can integrate with things you might already have, like uh, DB2 and Oracle, which certainly you can do with Microsoft. It just takes a, an extra step. Uh, the bad news is you have to make those choices. So you get the choices, but you have to make them. So what I'm going to talk about are some different choices that we can make in the Enterprise Web Development class, uh, weigh some choices against others, and explain why I chose to go with some choices versus others in our curriculum. So we have the IDE, Build Tools, User Interface, Object Instantiation, uh, the Controller, and the Database. Let's start with development environment. Certainly there are more options than I have here, but these are the ones that you'll think of a lot. Uh, Notepad or Notepad++. While you could develop a Java application with a text editor, these days the integrated development environments include a lot of productivity tools that will make your life easier if you use them. So editor, compiler, debugger, many times an emulator. NetBeans. Uh, I really like this for the introductory Java classes because it's a good complexity. It's a good balance of complexity versus usability. If you're just learning program, it doesn't throw too much at you at one time. Eclipse has been around for quite a while and has a lot of users, uh, me included. It is a kind of complicated and, to be honest, intimidating. But when you learn a few shortcuts, you learn how Eclipse can really save you a lot of time over uh, maybe using Notepad or Notepad++ or something like that. IntelliJ IDEA. Uh, a lot of people really like this integrated development environment. Uh, so one nice thing about it, as opposed to Eclipse, is that I find that IntelliJ oftentimes makes suggestions where Eclipse, you have to know the shortcut to use in that scenario, which when you've used it enough, you get to learn those shortcuts. Another note on IntelliJ, it is the basis of Android Studio, which is the Android development uh, IDE. So in our class, we're going to go with Eclipse. Eclipse is, I, won't, I don't know if I'd go as far as saying it's, it's, it's a standard, but it is something that you're going to see quite a bit in development. Okay, build tools. Uh, We've had Ant for a long time, uh, and then Maven Gradle, we're hearing a lot about those, and then we'll have a native build in Eclipse. So I want to look at each of these one at a time. Let's start with Ant. Ant, XML-based. As I said, been around a while. It's another one of those things where a lot of people really know it. It's, it's very commonly used. It is extendable as well. So it can build, but you can write Java classes and then express those classes through an XML tag and put that XML tag in your Ant script. 
So if you have some really custom build process you need to do, maybe you need to FTP something down from a server, then expand it, and then maybe change something inside of it, you can write a Java class to do this and then have Ant call that Java class. One huge benefit from Ant is that it's multi-platform, and because of that, you can do more than just build with it. People tend to think of Ant as a build tool, but it can do a lot of just general utility functions as well, like move a file from one directory uh, to another, uh, copy files, delete files, so really it's an all-purpose scripting tool. One trick with Ant uh, out of the box is that you have to handle your own dependencies on third-party libraries, things like that. It's a little bit tricky. Okay, next up is Maven. Maven does a really good job of providing a standard dependency management model. You create a file, POM XML, and you say what dependencies you need. Now, what do I mean by dependencies? I mean third-party libraries that you might be using. So you put in the library and the version, and what it will do is you can do an offline build where it will look for these libraries in a local directory on your computer, usually called an M2 directory on Windows that's under the user directory. If you can't find it and you're doing an online build, or in other words, not an offline build, uh, it can run out to a repository and download it automatically, which is nice. There are several public repositories, but then you can also, you can also make your own Nexus repository for your own third-party libraries that maybe you want to keep within your own firewall. So you can use it both with true third-party libraries from outside and your own inside. It has nice Eclipse integration. You just have to right-click, convert to, and choose Maven Project. Uh, it's generally not considered as extensible as Ant. It's not, uh, not as easy to write your own special build tasks that you're going to put in there and run by yourself. Okay, Gradle. Uh, Gradle is getting a lot more common. It does have some extensibility features. Uh, it's not XML based like Ant it's, uh, or Maven. Maven and Ant are both XML style. Uh, Gradle, I wouldn't really call it JSON, but it, it's kind of close. It has a similar lightweight syntax. This is used in uh, Android building as well now. So we're seeing Gradle is picking up a lot in popularity. Eclipse Build is great if you're very familiar with Eclipse and your project and you don't want to worry about learning another build system. It's a nice way to build a simple project without having to worry about setting up, configuring, and all of the other things that come with integrating a third-party build. Okay, for look and feel, we have several different options. We're going to start with the concept of X, uh, HTML and XHTML. Sorry, that should be XHTML. Uh, this goes back to the 90s. It's good for markup, look, and feel. The only trick is that web pages of the 90s, generally, you generate the web page, then you'd hit submit or you'd click a hyperlink. You get a brand new page. So traditionally not very dynamic. Uh, with Java, we got this concept of a servlet, which was a Java program that generates HTML syntax. It's nice if you need a dynamic look and feel, if you need something that's maybe based on a user, an account lookup, a balance inquiry, something like that. The only trick is, because it's a program that writes HTML, it's not as easy to take the HTML out and edit it. Uh, Typically, the person who is a programmer is not the same as the user experience person. These are both very important skills, uh, but typically, well, I should say, rarely does one person have uh, both skills, or very good at both skills. So we want to keep separate the look and feel from the actual code that's doing the work. JSPs came out later, and that's considered uh, an inside-out servlet. In other words, you essentially have an HTML page with lines of Java that can be injected into it. You still have that mix of UI and code, but it's a little easier to manage than just a Java class that's writing a web page. Finally, we have JSF, which is an HTML page with some special tags that we can use. Works very well with what we're going to call Java Beans or POJOs. Uh, if you've taken classes from me before, you've heard me talk a lot about a Java Bean or a POJO. It has a standard getter setter syntax. We want to think about DTOs, data transfer objects, which are an independent way to move data across layers in our application. We're going to see in this class that 
that syntax is going to pay off very well because these DTOs, Java Beans, POJOs, whatever you want to call them, we can set up as something called a managed bean, and then it's very easy to use it within a JSF page. Very nice. Okay, next we have the concept of object instantiation. And what do I mean by that? Well, object instantiation is how we instantiate an object. In other words, what you see down here, plant p equals new plant. You've probably seen this many times before. Well, for our objects, we need to make them managed beans for JSF to be able to use them. And we want to think a little bit about how to create objects. While we've used this syntax before, to be honest, we want to think about better ways that we can do it. How can we do it better? Well, remember the definition of polymorphism. That's another good interview question. What is polymorphism? That's one of those words that sounds complicated, and if you know the concept, it's very hard to explain. But polymorphism in one line is this. The variable type tells you what methods you're allowed to call, and the object type tells you what will happen. In other words, the variable and the object type do not need to be the same. This is the variable type. It's the type of this variable here. And this is the object type. It's what's going to go into that variable. They don't need to be the same, but there does need to be a relation. The object type has to uh, either be the same as the variable type, or the object type can be a subclass of the variable type, or the object type can be a class that implements the variable type if the variable type is an interface. Now, when I say interface, I don't mean a user interface. I mean a Java construction where we have a series of methods, and those methods are a contract. The methods in an interface say, if you implement this interface into a class, you must at some point create an implementation for these methods. What's nice about that is that all an interface is is a list of methods. And let's go back to the definition of polymorphism. Variable type tells you what methods you're allowed to call. That's the perfect description of an interface. An interface is just a list of methods. If a variable type is an interface, it's simply saying this is a list of methods you're allowed to call. And then the object type has to provide an implementation of those methods. Okay, so what does all this interface methods implementation, what does it all mean? Well, it's going to allow us to do something that's going to help us work very well with group members and also with unknown requirements. And that is, we can create an interface that says, here are the methods I want to call. Then we can create a stub implementation. We can provide that to our teammates and say, okay, I'm not finished with my work yet. But here's a stub implementation that you can use, and it uses this interface here. Now, they're no longer dependent on me finishing my part. They can continue to work against this interface. I am going to be working now on making an actual implementation of the class, maybe something that contacts to a database or something that, that uses a JSON stream. And I can work on that simultaneously while my while my group members are programming against this interface that I've specified. Then when I'm finished, I can very easily swap out the object type later, and that's the value of interfaces. The value is we set up this contract of methods, and we can swap out the actual object type. It tells you what will happen when you call those methods. We can swap that out later. So we can swap it either from a stub to an implementation, or from one implementation to another, maybe from a database to a JSON stream or a JSON stream to a web service or so on and so forth. So a lot of benefit if we improve that. And our options here, uh, a couple big options are Spring and CDI. Spring is an open source project that's been around for a long time, over 10 years, so 2002, actually about 13 years at this point. Uh, and uh, XML-based configuration, so with the XML, you can specify this object type. With Spring, you don't need this new plant stuff here. You don't need the keyword new. You don't need to call a constructor. Spring handles that for you. Now, newer, we have uh, annotations. And that's what we're going to use in this class. We're going to use annotations. Another benefit of Spring is it handles uh, database transactions well. And it uses something called aspect-oriented programming. Now, what I mean by database transactions, if you think about maybe a product and a price, 
Those are two different tables that we'll save into, possibly two different DAOs, data access objects. We don't want to wrap the transaction at that DAO layer because we want the product and the price to go together as one success unit in the database. So Spring provides a database transaction manager that will allow us to go up a level from the persistence layer, the DAO layer, up to the service, or in other words, the Java Bean layer or something like that, the business integration layer. So instead of wrapping a transaction around plant DAO, uh, sorry, uh, price DAO and separately product DAO, we wrap, wrap one transaction around a method called save, for instance. So Spring does a good job of that. CDI is a J2EE implementation a little bit newer. Uh, in our class, we could use CDI. Honestly, I see Spring used quite a bit in industry, so this is one little change I'm going to make from the J2EE documentation and, uh, that, that we have as our, as our reading for this course. I am going to use Spring. I think that's something that's going to be a, a, a benefit to know because it is very omnipresent. Uh, it's, it's something that you'll see quite a bit something that you'll see a lot on job applications, things like that. So for that reason, we're going to go with Spring. Okay, controller. Controller means when I click on a button, where do I go next? We could hard code it, but ugh, that's uh, not very maintainable in the long run. We could also use Struts or Struts2. Uh, very good frameworks. So I've used Struts and Struts2 very heavily in my own work. Uh, JSF provides a controller, and so does Spring. Spring provides something called MVC. I was on the, uh, I was really on the fence on this one. We could use any of these. Uh, I think we're going to run with JSF. JSF has a has a nice, easy to use controller interface. It's XML based. It says if I've come from this page and I've received this result, here's where I'm going to go next. Very similar to Struts2. Very similar to Spring. So they're all similar, just a, a slightly different syntax in some cases. For the database, we could use JDBC, which puts, puts SQL statements directly in our Java code. Again, oof, yuck. Um, that's mixing a couple different concepts. Hibernate is pretty common. Uh, Hibernate allows us to do XML mapping between our plain old Java object or our DTO, in other words, with SQL. Ibatis, MyBatis, very similar to Hibernate, just a different option. And then there's also a J2EE persistence model that's a bit newer. Uh, Hibernate, very common in the field. Most likely that's the one we're going to go with. So finally, our choices for this semester, for this class, Eclipse Development Environment, JSF for markup, Spring for object instantiation and dependency injection, Maven for our build tool because it makes Spring a lot easier. Spring is going to be an integration we're going to need to do. JSF for navigation. And then hibernate MySQL for persistence to a database. We can use either a locally created and deployed MySQL instance, uh, something called WAMP. Uh, it's Windows, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Uh, or we actually have a MySQL database available to us on ucfilespace.uc.edu. Either of those we can use, uh, pretty easy to get up and running. So this is a fairly standard stack you'll see a lot in, in the workplace. Uh, one exception is MySQL, you might see that, but you could also see Microsoft SQL Server, which is not the same as MySQL, by the way. Sounds similar, but not the same. DB2 or Oracle, those are fairly common. Um, but beyond that, uh, this is a fairly standard stack, and I think something that will give you a lot of good experience. So in the next few videos, we're going to look at startup and configuration. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.